afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. I'm LaVon Lawson. I'm president of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And I want to welcome you to our 65th annual Beverly Hills Bar Association Supreme Court Luncheon. As you can see, we are starting on time in order to conclude, as the court has requested, that it's due to its al after its cal afternoon calendar, it will need to be uh, completed by or before 1.15 p.m. Actually, the Supreme Court is on its way and they will be entering momentarily. So at this point, I want to make a number of introductions, uh, including our, the people on the dais, our officers, welcome our judges and, uh, and other persons, in our, um, such as in our deans and our friends, our sponsors and staff. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, welcome some folks. And what I'm going to ask of you is that for each category, if we could hold the applause until the end, and uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I'll remind you along the way. So initially, I would like to introdu introduce the people on our dais. So reading from my far left, or going from my far left, which is your right, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our mayor, John Marash, city of Beverly, mayor of the city of Beverly Hills, Jack McMorrow, barrister's president of Beverly Hills Bar Association, Linda Spiegel, president of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, Mark Steinberg, our Chief Executive Officer of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. I'm LaVon Lawson, President of the Bar Association. To my far right, uh, which is your left, we have Joshua Brabowski, Director of Policy and Ju Legislative Affairs of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Jennifer Mnookin, Dean, UCLA School of Law. Bonnie Moore, Chair of the Supreme Court Lunch Donor Committee. Thank you, Bonnie. So, I'd like to welcome my colleagues from the Beverly Hills Bar Association Executive Committee. So including me, there is our president-elect, Michael Sohigian, first vice president, Adam Siegler, second vice president, Anthony Ross, secretary treasurer, Malcolm McNeil, barrister's president, Jack McMorrow, barrister's president-elect, Nadira Imam, and immediate past president, Richard D. Kaplan. Welcome to our past presidents, uh, who are Nick Alice, Dixon Dern, Howard Fisher, Howard Fredman, Lawrence Goldman, Lawrence Jacobson, Richard Kaplan, Diane Karpman, Nancy Knupfer, Cynthia Pasternak, Kenneth Petrulis, Mark Poster, Stephen Raucher, Mark Steinberg, Linda Spiegel, and Mark Salas. Welcome to all of you. At this point, it is my great pleasure, pleasure to acknowledge our judges. Uh, so in a couple of minutes uh, after they arrive, uh, our Chief Justice, Tani Gore Kanto Sakaue, will introduce her colleagues on the Supreme Court of California. But at this time, it is my honor on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association to welcome currently sitting judicial officers to our luncheon this year. With the judges of the U.S. District Court, U.S. Courts of Appeals, and other federal judicial officers, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> and with the judges of the California Courts of Appeal, judges of the Superior Courts, and other state judicial officers, please stand and be recognized. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our law school deans. Dean Jennifer Mnookin, UCLA Law School. Uh, Assistant Dean Graham Scher, Loyola Law School. Dean Susan Prager, Southwestern School of Law. Student Life Coordinator Jamie Domke of Pepperdine School of Law. I'd also like to uh, say hello to um, Ron Broad, our incoming president of the LA County Bar Association. Welcome, everyone. So just finally, a couple more thank yous. Thank you to the following member benefit provider for its support of the Bar Association and this event. That's Swift Chip Incorporated. Thank you, Swift Chip. And I also want to thank, very importantly, our Chief Executive Officer, Mark Steinberg, and our incredible staff. Thank you very much for all that you do. Okay. 
So at this point, we are, I am pleased to honor our, to introduce and uh, introduce you to and honor our Beverly Hills uh, Mayor John Marash. Beverly Hills Mayor John Marash was elected to the Beverly Hills City Council in 2009, 2013, and 2017. He also served as mayor in 2013 and 2016. A fourth generation Beverly Hills resident, Mayor Marish, lived abroad for a number of years working as a film executive in marketing and distribution before returning to his hometown. He is a firm believer that local government, when done right, is the best form of democracy. Please join me in welcoming Mayor John Marish. Thank you very much and good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Beverly Hills Bar Association's annual Supreme Court Luncheon. I'm Beverly Hills Mayor John Marish, and it is truly an honor to welcome this extraordinary group of gifted professionals here today at the Four Seasons Los Angeles at Beverly Hills. That means the hotel isn't actually in Beverly Hills, but it's close enough for me to be able to park my car in Beverly Hills and walk here. Think of it as the hotel version of the Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim. I'd also like to recognize all of the judges from the Superior Court, Federal District Court, and Court of Appeals, and the law firms that have come together for this annual tradition within walking distance of our beautiful city. And of course, a special welcome, they're not here yet, but when they get here, to the Diana Rosses of our judicial system, our Supreme Court justices at the Supreme Court luncheon. Though not a lawyer myself, I actually am an honorary member of the LA Lawyers Philharmonic and Legal Voices. And, and um, we do actually, as council members, occasionally serve in a quasi-judicial role. And so I have appreciation of all that you do. That often means trying to interpret the law and the intent of legislators, which I can tell you is no easy task. Sometimes I feel we would all do well to remember that ultimately, power derives from the people. As much as Sacramento doesn't like being preempted by Washington, D.C., cities don't like it when Sacramento politicians run amok and fail to respect the uniqueness of our individual communities. Cities are where we live, and as you just heard, I truly do believe that local government, when done right, is the best form of democracy because it's closest to home, and home is an almost sacred concept. It's my hope that all of our lawmakers remember the principles of subsidiarity, which are enshrined in federalism, and at least to some extent, some feel within our country's constitution, and that we all remember that the diverse and unique communities within our dynamic state are the solution and not the problem. As a judicial community, your collective accomplishments play a critical role in how we live because interpretation of the law is that important. Hopefully, whether lawmakers or law interpreters, we all strive to create justice, tolerance, choice, truth, and fairness within our society. Sadly, fairness is a much underappreciated value. How many of us as children told our parents that something wasn't fair only to be met with the stock response, hey, life isn't fair? In my son's almost 11 years, I've never used that answer as an excuse, not once. Life isn't always fair, but I've always taught him that it is our duty to try to make life fair. It is our duty to engage in tikkun olam and repair this fragile world. And that is what continues to motivate me as a public servant, and I know it drives many of you as well. My colleagues on the Beverly Hills City Council join me in recognizing your invaluable leadership dedication and accomplishments, and we applaud the Beverly Hills Bar Association and Beverly Hills Bar Foundation for the outstanding outreach programs and networking opportunities that benefit our community at large. We're so proud to once again host this luncheon within walking distance to beautiful Beverly Hills, <laughs> and we hope that you enjoy your time near our city and maybe even venture dare to venture within our borders after lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Miris. <laughs>
this point, I'd like to introduce uh, Beverly Hills Bar Foundation President Linda Spiegel. The Beverly Hills Bar Foundation is a charitable affiliate of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. And among other very worthwhile projects, it provides scholarships to deserving law students. It is my pleasure to introduce the president of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, Linda Spiegel. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> my first order of business is to recognize the past presidents and acknowledge and thank our scholarship donors. So our foundation past presidents are Bonita Moore, Geraldine Wiley, Kenneth Petrullis, Nick Alice, and Steve Gardner. This year, the following firms and scholarship donors, uh, which means their names are inscribed on each scholarship certificate given today, and we'd like to thank them. The scholarship donors are Girardi Keese, Greenis Martin, Stein, and Richland, LLP, Sidley Austin, LLP, USC Gould School of Law, Beverly Hills Bar Association Institute on Entertainment, Law, and Business. We'd also like to thank our Champions of Justice donors, Aiken Gump, Strauss, Hauer, and Feld, Greenberg, Lusker, Oldman, Cooley, Salas, Bernberg, Coleman, and Gold, Chernoff, Bidart, Echevera, Valenci, Rose. Our press reception co-sponsors, Freeman, Freeman, and Smiley, Judicate West, our Rule of Law Writing Competition sponsor, Kenneth and Dale Petrullis, and special, special donor recognition, Bonita Moore. And all the members who made contributions, thank you, one and all. As it has been our tradition, we invite past Bar Association scholarship recipients to make remarks at our luncheon. This year, we are pleased to welcome Joshua Bobrowski, Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs in the Executive Office of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Joshua received a BHBA scholarship in 2007 when he was attending the UCLA School of Law. He went on to obtain a Master's of Public Health, practiced law as a civil litigator, practiced commercial litigation, and employment law. His focus now is on public health. In his current role, Joshua advances the department's policy and legislative agenda and shapes policy positions for the department. Please join me and we take great pride in welcoming our past recipients to see how well they've done and how much they've achieved. Please welcome Joshua Bobrowski. Thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation for the privilege of speaking with you today. I'm especially grateful to address you as a previous scholarship recipient during the, Cal uh, the Supreme Court luncheon. My parents are quelling that I get to finally speak before the Honorable California Chief Justice and the other members of the Supreme Court. I'm also delighted to be here with UC or as, a, as a Bruin uh, with UCLA School of Law being well represented by Dean Mnookin. I look forward to hearing both of them address us this afternoon. Two momentous events happened for me in 2007. I married my husband, although our wedding was not yet recognized by the state, and I received the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation scholarship. Both had a substantial impact on my second summer during law school. My first summer, I clerked for District Court Judge Howard Matz and appreciated the opportunity to gain insight about effective legal arguments, how decision makers shape the law, and how judges can treat everyone from uh, defendants and counsel alike with dignity and respect. For my second summer, I was interested in participating in impact litigation and delving deeper into health policy. I secured an externship at Western Center on Law and Poverty. I was honored to have been selected for the Bar Foundation scholarship. It certainly lessened financial burdens for the summer and into the last year of law school. The scholarship also came with a level of validation from pursuing work that didn't have as much financial reward as working for a firm. When you go to work for a place with poverty in the title, you're not expecting to rake in the big bucks. The scholarship eased some of the pressure to pursue more lucrative summer experiences 
and honored the choice of community service. During the summer, I participated in litigation over slum housing conditions near downtown LA and in efforts to support clients seeking Medicaid coverage. I recall speaking with one client and, uh, and drafting a declaration on her behalf. It was challenging to elicit uh, emotionally painful information from her about the effects of not having health coverage. She candidly related the choices she made between foregoing needed medications and dental work to cover basic necessities. I was grateful for the privilege of communicating her words through legal means to address her lack of health care coverage. After law school and gaining experience in law practice, I returned to the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health to advocate for effective health policies and health equity. Today, I help craft legislative responses to pressing public health issues, such as advocating for funding and strategies to address the persistent gap in infant mortality rates among African Americans compared to whites and other racial ethnic groups. In thinking about the importance of the Barr Foundation scholarship, I appreciate that the Barr Foundation can help address issues of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the legal profession. By financially supporting and honoring the pursuits of law students coming from communities of color, women, LGBT communities, and other diverse backgrounds, the Barr Foundation can help ensure the next generation of lawyers and change agents better reflects the demographics of California. In recent testimony before the state legislature, Chris Punangbayan of California Change Lawyers noted that 95% of prosecutors are white, and overall 67% of our California judges are white. In a system with substantial overrepresentation of people of color and men of color, in, par uh, in particular among those who are incarcerated, he points out that the fact that black and brown Californians are overpunished is not coincidental. This ongoing inequity and systemic institutional racism perpetuate a lack of trust in and undermine our democratic institutions. To ensure a more fair and just society, we need to meet the legal needs of all California communities. Having lawyers who come from and understand our diverse communities throughout our legal institutions and seats of power is one necessary, important step. The financial burdens of law school are a significant barrier to entry for far too many and contribute to the lack of diversity in the legal profession. Annual law school costs at UCLA are now about 48,000 per year for in-state tuition and more than 25,000 for estimated living expenses, quite a bit more than when I was attending UCLA. In addition, the bar cut rate is also a substantial barrier of entry to many in the field. Systemic solutions are needed to address the financial barriers to entry uh, for the legal field and uh, the bar cut rate as well. The Beverly Hills Bar Foundation scholarships help by supporting public interest work and address equity, inclusion, and diversity in the field. I'm grateful for being a past recipient for the scholarship and congratulate this year's recipients. Thank you again for the privilege of speaking with you today. Your money well spent, your scholarship dollars well invested. Joshua is one of the inspiring past recipients and you will see how inspiring our future recipients are. Um, as I proceed, I just want to warn you, I have lots of thanks to give. I'm a very grateful person, so indulge me. I wish to thank Donor Development Committee Chair Benita Moore and committee members Howard Fredman, Dira Imam, Mark Poster, Ann Simley, and Mark Steinberg. I would also like to thank the Scholarship Committee Chair Alan Forsley and committee members Natalia Aronovich, Robert Aronoff, Judith Dornstein, Doron Igbali, Ferris Greenberger, Marion Miller, Bonita Moore, and Darren Schlechter. And thank you to the Rule of Law Committee Chair Ken Petrullis and committee members Don Colson, Matthew Kanan, Mark Lieberman, Benita Moore and Mark Poster. As you can hear, lots of names are being repeated because we have a very, very dedicated volunteer membership. Class of 2019, Beverly Hills Bar Foundation Scholar recipients not only are academically qualified and have financial need, but more importantly, each has demonstrated a commitment to community service. Our scholarship committee interviewed outstanding students. 
all of those we interviewed had done extraordinary community service work and were deserving and could have benefited from a scholarship from the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation. However, our funding allowed us to award just one scholarship from each of the five law schools whom we honor today. On behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation, it is my honor to present the 2019 Law School Scholarship recipients. Meet them now as they introduce themselves in a brief video. Elise Clemente, I am a law student at Loyola Law School, and the reason I decided to pursue a career in law was because I knew that there's a lot of um, vulnerable population who are in need of the legal services and they don't have access to it. So uh, coming from a background similar to that population, I believe I can be uh, a very good advocate for those needs. Uh, my name is Cameron Sheldon. Uh, I attend the University of California, Irvine School of Law and I came to law school to make a difference, um, to help others um, and to empower them through the law. My name is Ashley Torres and I am a rising 3L at Pepperdine Law. Um, well, I was raised by a 13-year-old single mom and I grew up in housing projects in an old agricultural labor camp in Ventura County. And it was actually Justice Corps, which is an internship at the Long Beach Superior Courthouse, where I realized that the way I wanted to give back to my community was through law school. My name is Adam Cohen. I'm a third year law student at UCLA School of Law. And my background in policy, in local government, organizing, and working with youth really inspired me and got me excited about a career in law and public service. My name is Celeste Sanchez. I just finished my second year at Southwestern Law School. I decided to go to law school to be an advocate for those who have been victims or survivors of violent crimes. In undergraduate, I was part of a group that basically facilitated dialogue on campus on how to be an empowered bystander and how to prevent sexual assault and domestic violence. My name is Ella Casade. I go to Pepperdine Law and I decided to go to law school because I was interested in getting involved with the reformation of the criminal justice system and uh, prison reform, and I felt that that was uh, you know, a huge problem in the States, and it's something that I wanted to address. My name is Morel Raza. I go to USC Gould School of Law, and I chose to go into law to help victims of sexual assault and violence. My involvement in public service and pro bono work started in South Texas. I started working for a nonprofit in Harlingen, Texas, which renders aid to unaccompanied minors from Central America. And in that capacity, uh, as a paralegal, I help children um, from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador develop their defenses against removal, uh, against federal immigration enforcement. I decided to get involved in that kind of field because I felt that uh, the criminal justice system as it stands doesn't particularly favour the indigent and so I wanted to be a voice to people who didn't necessarily have a voice. Hi, I'm Cindy Tobisman. We're here to congratulate the Rule of Law winners and the scholarship students on their awesome achievement. My firm, Grainis Martin Stein in Richland, is one of the scholarship donors and we are so proud to support you. The most satisfying part of community service is that I actually get to help people and it's, although it's not a very, it's not a change that I'm making, you know, right away, but it, there's small steps for people and people that I get to help are so grateful and they love interacting with law students, especially students of color who come from similar backgrounds of these people that we're helping. And I think, you know, it's a very powerful role that I have been able to take during law school. Helping underrepresented communities like mine is really the most gratifying experience. Being able to see people come in and, in and out of the center transformed and seeing them gain a little bit more faith in the justice system 
makes it worth it for me. And I want to devote my life to helping communities like that. In the fall, I was part of the Youth and Justice Clinic at UCLA School of Law. And in that, we partnered with the LA Board of Supervisors and created a project to look at the ways that the county was incarcerating pregnant young girls. I was a group of five UCLA students, and we met with stakeholders and produced a report that eventually turned into a bill that the Board of Supervisors passed to eliminate the practice of incarcerating pregnant youth. So a couple weeks ago, actually during spring break, um, I was part of a practicum, immigration practicum at Loyola Law School, and I had the chance to defend a client before immigration court in El Paso, Texas, which was an amazing experience because it was the first time I've ever been in immigration court. Um, we did a lot of work. It was a, a lot of hard work um, during the whole week, and we actually went in twice into the courtroom because it was extended. Me and another student from the class, we had the opportunity to be there and defend her, to show and defend her case, and luckily she was able to get a positive outcome. The most impactful thing I did at the San Francisco District Attorney's Office included participating with the San Francisco Police Department in their human trafficking sting operations, which included massage parlors, brothels, and hotel sting operations. I did direct service on the scene and worked directly with survivors to get them housing after the operation or services. Hi, my name is Tom Girardi. I'm with the law firm Girardi Keys, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be here to say congratulations. Scholarship winners, congratulations. Take these scholarships, become a spectacular lawyer, and it's gonna be something you're gonna love the rest of your life. Beverly Hills Bar Association, Beverly Hills Foundation, how great are you to think of things like this to help and believe me, you're gonna love it. Thank you. My proudest accomplishment so far is that this semester I was able to get published uh, three times. Uh, so those were all areas uh, that were very um, important to me, um, including you know, restorative justice, which pertains to this particular award, and uh, family law, uh, which is something that um, is quite a sensitive thing for me too. And I think just being able to get my voice out and make a difference uh, through those publications has been really meaningful to me. My proudest accomplishment is an uh, oral argument that I recently delivered on behalf of a client I've been working with uh, for over a year. The client won relief in the form of uh, a motion to vacate his conviction, which rendered him removable. The state appealed, and I successfully defended that appeal here in the California Court of Appeals uh, down in San Diego. This last summer, I worked at the LA County Public Defender's Office, and I was tasked with drafting a motion and dismiss for two different clients. And I had to, it was a new area of law, so I had to find the law and write a memo about it, and it was the first of its kind here for the county. And I, in five weeks, I was able to draft that and see it through so that the attorney presented it to the judge and the judge granted both motions. And that was really rewarding to see the clients who had this record for such a long time be free of that and really live their lives. My interest in participating in this competition is to shed a light on the challenges that non-citizens face uh, in accessing justice, um, in trying to vindicate their rights, and to enjoy the fundamental right of access to the courts. I was very interested in restorative justice in general, and I wanted to you know, get something out there that pertained to the way um, the uh, system is set up in terms of the school to prison pipeline, which is what I ended up discussing in my paper. And I feel that that's a huge area that needs attention. And so I felt that if I was able to, uh, you know, participate in the school, the rule of law competition, it would be a way to get some attention to that particular field. After law school, for sure, I know I want to be into public interest. I'm not sure yet exactly what kind of nonprofit, but I know I want to work 
um, either with the immigrant rights or civil rights. I know that I want to give back to my community, whether that be a district attorney or a public defender, really. I think a long-term goal of mine is to become a judge, and I think we need more women on the bench, so that's really motivating me. My plans after law school include working in government. I'm interested in a DA's office or working with the federal government. After law school, I hope, and after passing the bar, I hope to be a district attorney in Los Angeles, and there's nothing better than I would want to do than help people in my community. After I graduate uh, in August of 2019, I will be clerking for Chief Judge Bradley Maxa in the Washington State Court of Appeals Division II in Tacoma, Washington. After law school, I intend to go into the prison reform line of work. Uh, I'll probably be working uh, initially as a public defender or a fe federal public defender. Uh, but any way that I can get my hands into the criminal justice system, uh, that's probably what I'll be doing. I hope to become a public defender, ideally here in Los Angeles County. Hi, I'm Jean-Claude Andre, the West Coast Head of Sidley Austin Supreme Court and Appellate Practice. We at Sidley are very proud to be supporters of the Supreme Court Luncheon at the scholarship donor level and to help honor the law student scholarship recipients and the rule of law competition winners. Thank you so much to the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation and Association. Because with their support, I am able to continue with my education and pursue exactly the career path that I wanted to. This has been a tremendous help to my legal career and one less stress that I have to worry about in law school. Thank you so much to the Beverly Hills Bar Association and Foundation for this opportunity. It means so much as someone going into a career of public service and public defense to have that financial backing and support from the community. Thank you so much to the Beverly Hills Bar Association and Bar Foundation. I am incredibly grateful and humbled by this award. Thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association Foundation and Rule of Law Competition Committee. It's a huge honor to be a part of this event and I'm truly grateful. We congratulate the scholarship recipients and award winners, and I ask you to stand and remain standing as I call your name. Aurelis Clementi of Loyola Law School. <laughs> Ashley Denise Torres of Pepperdine University School of Law. Adam Oriel Cohen of UCLA School of Law. Mirel Raza of USC Gould School of Law, who is not here today, but she deserves a round of applause, no, nevertheless. <laughs> Celeste Sanchez of Southwestern Law School. <laughs> Our Rule of Law Writing Competition Grand Prize winner, Cameron Sheldon of UC Irvine School of Law. Our Rule of Law Honorable Mention winners, Elika Zadeh Pe of Pepperdine University School of Law and Danielle, <laughs> and Danielle Kasatli of UC Davis School of Law, who is not here, but again, deserves uh, applause. <laughs> the scholarship and winner certificates will be presented by Scholarship Committee Chair Alan Forsley and Rule of Law Committee Chair Ken Petrullis at the conclusion of the luncheon. I have been asked by the Beverly Hills Bar Association Board of Governors to inform each of these law students that they will also receive a complimentary BHBA membership for the year and we do hope you will attend our programs, become involved and, and be participants and volunteers as I have read off all the wonderful names. So welcome and congratulations. And now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Bonnie Moore, Chair of the Development Donor Committee and a past president of the foundation, 
She is a principal with Moore Riddell in Century City, practicing in the areas of business and entertainment litigation, employment litigation, product liability, professional liability, and a wonderful friend. Bonnie? Thank you so much. The name Bonita Moore that you've been hearing is also me. <laughs> um, the Beverly Hills Bar Association and the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation are very honored to welcome Chief Justice Tani Gore Kantosakaue to the 65th, believe it or not, annual Beverly Hills Bar Association Supreme Court Luncheon. Chief Justice Tani Gore Kantosakaue is the 28th Chief Justice of the state of California. She was sworn into office on January 3rd, 2011, seems time flies, <laughs> and is the first Asian Filipina American and the second woman to serve as the state's chief justice. At the time she was nominated as chief justice, she had already served more than 20 years on California trial and appellate courts, including six years on the Court of Appeal, third appellate district in Sacramento. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Chief Justice Tani Gray, Kanto Sakaui. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and to you, thank you, thank you, please, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that generous welcome here. On behalf of the California Supreme Court, we thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association and your foundation for your kind invitation every year to honor us. I've been coming nine years now, and I know colleagues with me have been here even longer. It is my pleasure to introduce them to you, our first full bench in quite a few years. And I'll start and introduce all of us by way of order of seniority. And I'll start with Justice Ming Chin. How many years, Ming, have you been coming to the Beverly Hills Bar Association? Lunch. 22. He might hold the record. And then, of course, Justice Carol Corrigan. <laughs> Justice Goodwin Liu. <laughs> Justice Mariano Florentino Cuellar. Justice Leandra Kruger. And long awaited and highly anticipated Justice Groban. All of us here are happy to be here with you and also with our colleagues from the Superior Court of Los Angeles and the Court of Appeals, second DCA. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share a few words. I first want to thank the scholarship winners. Uh, your speeches here, your hopes for the future warm all of our hearts. You inspire us with your interest in social justice, your awareness of what's happening in California and the United States, and your commitment to do better and greater for people who have no voice. The same is true with congratulations to the rule of law contestants. I'm sure that's a fierce competition, particularly in writing. And writing is so important to the work we do. It's our writing that lives on and influences others. So thank you for your good work and I look forward to your future careers. And speaking of future careers, hearing from Joshua was really enlightening. To hear his path, to hear his interest, to hear what you're doing with your talent. Beverly Hills Bar Association has an uncanny knack for picking stars who will change lives in California. So thank you Joshua for those words. It was inspiring for all of us to hear. I've been asked to tell you a few things about the state of the judiciary, and I thought I'd begin with telling you the most important aspect of the state of the judiciary is probably that we have a new governor. And by that, I mean, of course, all things old are now all things new for the new governor. And we prepare a packet of transitional information to the new administration. I will say that with Governor Brown, we were blessed with the help of Josh Groban to have over 600 new appointments that really reflect the diversity of California's strength of our people and our differences and our celebrated changes. And now, of course, with that in mind and our best fiscal year we're in now with Governor Brown, we started the negotiations with Governor Newsom. I'll tell you, it helps that his father was a Court of Appeal Justice. <laughs> 
It helps uh, that he's a father of four with a very active leadership wife. It helps uh, that he's also a business person and therefore is very friendly in the legal community because of the work he does. And so this year in our discussions, we haven't had to go to the mat over a lot of issues. We've had to arm wrestle, surely, for financial stability for the judiciary, but because his theme is California for all, or one California, he really does see the judiciary, the people we serve, the cases the lawyers bring, as essential to supporting California for all. And so his proposed budget in January, now after the May revise for the judiciary, is really only better now it's true, unlike Governor Brown, he didn't come into an administration eight years ago with a $26 billion deficit, and of course didn't come in with the uproar, but of course he comes in with a vision of building upon Governor Brown's work, and he does so inclusively, and he does so with an open mind. And for us in the judiciary, that's resulted specifically in more additional funds, rather, for technology because he recognizes that people may want to connect remotely, but those who don't need to or want to can still come to court. Additionally, he recognizes the deficit of judges throughout many counties, particularly the Inland Empire, because of the population growth, and has offered in his proposed budget 25 new judges. Now, it's true that the devil is in the details because the Judicial Council, our rulemaking, policymaking body, we want to distribute the judges according to our formula of need, but it may be politically that he wants to designate where those judges go. That's going to be the discussion we'll have in the future. But all this is to say that the judicial judiciary is on strong footing thanks to the work of Governor Brown getting us here and thanks to the open-mindedness of Governor Newsom and his One California and his interest in children, his interest in families, his interest in basic care that, as you know, when challenged comes through the courts. Additionally, I would say that in terms of our judiciary today, we are much changed in the last nine years that I've been Chief Justice. And one of those changes particularly has been that our filing statewide has gone down by 40%. So we are looking just sort of generally at a time where we saw at one point a high level of filings in California of 10 million. Now we're looking at more like 6 million. But the truth is, is even though filings have gone down, complexity has gone up. And the truth is, without lawyers, because we've seen our population in the courts change from lawyers in the hall to actually pro se litigation in the hall, pro se litigants in the hall, we're looking at more complexities. We're looking at more outreach, we're looking at more explanation, and we're looking at more education. And this is why, as one of the scholarship winners said, that she got her start in Justice Corps, which uses students as assistants and helps people get through the process of filling out the forms when they don't have an attorney and appearing in court. We are seeking to build upon that, because I don't believe we're going to change anytime soon that we will see more lawyers or the advent of lawyers back in the halls with all the different alternatives that law has to settle disputes. So we are we are proposing a concept, actually, of wayfinders. Along with technology, along with better forms, we're looking at a way for people who come into the court can actually feel welcome and receive information. And that would be a wayfinder program, where we take employees who, that we know know the court system, who greet people, who direct people, who are bilingual, who sit in court with pro se litigants, who may care to speak if the pro se litigant asks the person to speak for them. So these wayfinders would be people or court navigators would be a new feature of the judicial branch in California, one we're looking to use fresh, inspired, enthusiastic, committed and compassionate individuals to help people in need. Because under any circumstance, coming to court is a stressful situation. And I know with the Beverly Hills Bar Association and your continued support, especially through the lean years, when you went to the legislature, when you went to your, your contacts and you spoke on behalf of the judiciary for stable funding, we succeeded. It was your voices in the community that helped us in this process, that joined forces with other voices that got the legislature to think twice about cutting the judiciary and then restoring it when times became better. So we're thankful for your efforts. We look forward to the future, your grooming of these students who will be stars in our profession, who we can rely on to carry the voice of social justice. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for a delicious meal. Thank you for your support, always. So 
Thank you very much to our Chief Justice, Chief Justice Kanto Sakaue, and to the entire Supreme Court for your presence here today. Um, we do have another featured speaker. Uh, the Supreme Court is going to be leaving now due to its timeline, but we thank them. This was so wonderful to have them here. At this point, it is my honor to introduce Dean Jennifer Manukin of the UCLA School of Law. We are delighted to welcome Jennifer Manukin, Dean of UCLA School of Law, and the David G. Price and Dallas P. Price Professor of Law. Jennifer has been a member of the UCLA Law faculty since 2005 and became Dean of the School of Law in August of 2015. Dean Manukin received her Bachelor of Arts from Harvard College, holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and received her JD from Yale Law School. She is currently ex officio on the BHBA's Board of Governors, holding the designated law school dean position for 2018-2019. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dean Jennifer Manukin, Dean of the UCLA School of Law. Thank you so much for that generous introduction and also for the opportunity to speak to all of you for a few minutes. Uh, I wanted to start too by giving a very warm congratulations to this year's scholarship winners. Your stories inspire us. For me as a law school dean, they are part of why I get up every morning and do what I do. It's so that students like you can change the world in the ways that I know you're going to. And so I just want to say thank you for inspiring us and thank you to the Beverly Hills Bar Association Association and the Beverly Hills Bar Foundation for providing support to inspiring students precisely like these. I would also be remiss not to acknowledge another dean in the room who was acknowledged earlier as well, Susan Prager from Southwestern Law School. Who, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> who served for me as a mentor and friend and predecessor. She was the first female dean of UCLA Law School. And I truly stand on her shoulders. I'm the third female dean of UCLA Law School, and that simply wouldn't be the case without all that Susan did in her role there. Um, and she continues to serve the law schools of California with a few other pretty major jobs in between. Um, I was asked to speak to you for just a few minutes about some of what's on the mind of law school deans these days. And so I'm going to share with you just a few thoughts, um, speaking from my own position at UCLA Law School, but which I think, like resonate to most of my colleagues at other law schools here as well. First of all, I wanted to share something which probably most of you in this room already know, which is that there was a significant period of decline in law school applications all across the country and also in California. And that has now turned around quite meaningfully. For the class of 2021 who began last year, there was an 8% increase in applicants across the nation after a year or two before that that was pretty flat. At UCLA Law School, we saw about a 14% increase. And these are pretty significant numbers. And this year, we've also seen them stabilize or go up even a little bit more. Um, this is, I think, good news for our profession. Um, and I don't think it's an accident about why some of that is happening. There was a period where it might be flippant to say so, but there was a way in which all the cool kids were looking at tech. Technology was sort of getting tons of energy um, from undergraduate institutions, and uh, law school wasn't as much in the picture. And I do think that what's happened um, recently is more attention to civil society democracy, the importance of judges, the importance of the rule of law as something that can't be taken for granted. I don't think this is a political point exactly. I think this is across the spectrum. It's that we've seen awareness that the rule of law and democracy aren't simply there. They, are, they, they need to be um, maintained and developed, and it is lawyers and judges who are at the very heart of that process. And so this is leading increasing students to be interested in law school. It is also leading increasing number of students to be very interested in giving back, 
in devoting a part or all of their careers to social justice. Again, you got a glimpse of that in these very inspiring videos, and Joshua and his life as well is an example of that. And one of the, that, that's wonderful and inspiring, but it also does create additional pressure around debt and the debt of law school graduates. And so that also is very much on the mind of all law school deans. There too, I wanna to thank the Beverly Hills Bar Association and Foundation because scholarship support of the kind that you provide is one piece of that jigsaw puzzle. Josh, Joshua shared uh, the, the cost of tuition at UCLA Law School. It's still around forty-five dollars to $60,000 less than most of our peer private institutions, but it is a lot more than it used to be. Um, and that's partly because the state at this point only provides about 15% of our budget, even though we are a public law school. And so thinking about managing debt and how to help our students manage debt so that they can make the career choices to pursue their dreams is certainly something that is very much on the minds of law school deans. A third element that is on the minds of law school deans, including me, is diversity and how to bring increasing diversity to our profession. I think that we have all collectively made some progress here, but there's certainly more to be done. At my law school this past year, about 41% of our entering class uh, self-defined as students of color, defined as African American, Latino, Native American, or Asian American, and slightly more than half women. Um, and those numbers are, are certainly better than they were for us a decade earlier, um, but they still don't represent the full diversity of our great state. And so how we can help um, encourage uh, students from all backgrounds to feel like law has a place for them and that they can succeed is a project that is still very much underway. A fourth thing that is on the minds of law school deans um, is curriculum and how to train students for a rapidly changing profession. Now, I know hardly anyone in this room graduated more than 20 years ago, right? Um, most of you are, are recent grads, more recent than me. Well, maybe, maybe there's a mix here. Um, but, um, but what I would say for those of us who graduated a while ago, there are things about the law schools, the law schools that have changed a lot and things that haven't. The first year curriculum looks pretty much the same. I would say that for most of us in this room, whenever we went to law school, including our current law students, the subjects and many dimensions of the approach to the first year have been pretty stable. The same is not true about the second and third year of law school. And one dramatic change has been across law schools, a serious increase in focus on experiential education and the chance for students, wall students, to roll up their sleeves and begin to have the experiences of practice. Now, there were elements of that that go back a long ways, including at my own law school, um, under Susan Prager's leadership and, and, and otherwise. And this isn't something brand new, but it has absolutely increased significantly. To give you a couple of examples from UCLA of clinics that we've, we've expanded or created just in the past few years, they include a veterans clinic to help veterans, vulnerable veterans with benefits issues and elsewhere and otherwise an immigrant family clinic in coordination with a school, an LAUSD school, that the Ed School at UCLA also is involved with to help some of the children and families at that school with their immigration needs. A documentary film clinic where our students can help fledgling documentary filmmakers with important stories to tell, but who have no resources for a lawyer um, to get the help that they need um, to make these films go forward. And then criminal justice clinics, environmental clinics, human rights clinics, and some other transactional clinics as well are just a few examples. And the ABA now requires every law student to take at least six credits while they're in law school of experiential education. But I know at my law school, many of our students do far more than that. And I think that would be true of all of the other law schools um, uh, in the room as well. An issue we struggle with and a place where we could use your help is in a changing profession. How do we best navigate for year, how do we teach our students to be ready on day one, but also on year, in year 10? 
The profession is changing. The ways that technology are being used are transforming. The pathways for success are not stable. And so we want our students to graduate ready to begin, but we also want them to have the resilience and the long-term forms of learning that will help them as, as the lives of lawyers change. And I know I would welcome input from those of you in this room about how we could do that still better. And here too, I think I speak for all of my fellow deans as well. Another issue on the mind of every law school dean in California is the bar exam. As most of you probably have seen, pass rates have been very low in this state. It's always been harder than elsewhere, but they've been um, even lower in the last few years than ever before. We appreciate that the Supreme Court has indicated a willingness to take a look at that issue and to see whether, we, whether it makes sense to do something about California's atypical cut score. And I appreciate that this is a complex issue, um, but certainly an important one for the lawyers of our state and the diversity of our profession. Finally, an issue that is certainly on my mind, and again here I think I'm not alone, is the challenge of talking across difference in polarizing times. This is not an easy moment for our nation. And lawyers, I think, can play an incredibly important role at modeling the importance of careful, serious listening to those with disparate points of view. That doesn't mean we need to be persuaded necessarily by those with whom we disagree. But we will do our jobs better when we listen carefully to others. And making sure that we are training our students to be passionate and talented advocates who also know the importance of listening across difference is one final thing that is certainly on my mind as a law school dean. I hope this gives you some sense of, what's, uh, of, what, of what law schools or law school deans are thinking about and what's going on um, with law schools. I appreciate that I have a variety of alums in the room, as well as uh, others who, who are uh, graduates of many great law schools across the state and nation. Um, it's been a real honor to get this chance to talk to all of you today. And again, thank you so much for supporting these scholarships and our students and all of the ways that you make our profession something to be so very proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Manukin, for your remarks. Very much appreciated. With that, we invite everyone to attend our Supreme Court lunch next year. We invite you to take a copy of the Daily Journal, and we are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>